It's episode 19 of the Keto for Women show. You're listening to the Keto for Women show, and I'm your host and nutritionist, Sean Miner. This show is designed to empower women to find their own expression of the keto diet to maximize their health and happiness. Now let's get started with today's episode. Hey, hey, friends. Welcome back to Keto for Women. Happy to have you here as always. And I am back from vacation. It was a great week in Belize with some of my friends. And man, that place is just a special place. I just can't, words can't describe. I think it really comes with uh, getting to know the people and the culture and their way of life instead of going to a place that has been kind of quote unquote Americanized. It's really you being involved in their culture, and that's how it was for the past week, being in Belize and loving every moment of their food and what they do and the people there. Everything is just so cool there, and I know you don't care that much about my vacation, but you might be interested to know what I ate there, and I will say that I probably spent about 75 to 80% of the time having ketogenic meals and snacks. And it was very easy to eat a ketogenic diet there while still being able to enjoy the food that is there in their culture. The only thing really is they are pretty heavy on the rice and beans and plantains. Those are the two things that I did have a few bites of here and there for some of the meals just because I wanted to experience that culture and that's something that's really important to me when I do travel is that I want to have a healthy balance of feeling really good and also being able to experience other lifestyles. And so being able to be keto when it was really easy and felt really good and right and then being able to try some new dishes and some foods that I probably wouldn't have at home if I were just doing my thing. Uh, that's had I had a really nice balance of that, and I'm really happy with how it turned out. Uh, but like I said, there were many meals that I went without the rice that was offered. There, I think there was rice at pretty much every single plate of food I had, but a lot of times that just wasn't necessary, and you could have the curry or the fish or the steak or whatever it was without needing that extra carbohydrate or whatever was on the side. So that happened quite a bit, but there were a few times that the rice, like there was one situation in particular where we were horseback riding on a 400 acre farm on the mainland and went through their entire farm and it was just gorgeous, the most beautiful place, basically in a jungle. And uh, they grow all of their own food, they source all of it, and they provided us lunch. And I'm going to eat their plantains and rice and beans because it came from that specific area and they had so much pride in their food and it was a delicious meal. And so, yeah, I had a few bites of both of those and it was great. And I wasn't concerned about it at all. They also have a chocolate company there right where we were in San Pedro, Belize, where they source all of their cacao beans, their sugar cane, everything they use for the chocolate, they source right from Belize. And so, yes, I definitely tried their 70% dark chocolate. It, it was fabulous. And I felt like that was an appropriate thing to do. So I just want to share this information because, A, I guess for you all to know that I'm human and I'm not always in ketosis and it's totally fine with me, but also B, to maybe help you understand what it could be like to travel while being on a ketogenic diet and it doesn't have to be this all or nothing thing, which I think a lot of people assume, and I used to be that way when I traveled as well, it doesn't need to be like, while I'm not at home, I'm on vacation, I'm just going to go crazy. Nor does it need to be, well, I'm following this strict diet, so I have to keep following this strict diet, which I don't want you to feel that anyways, any day of the week, but definitely not when you're traveling. And really that whole mentality can be just completely diminished in my opinion. But 
when you have this as a lifestyle, as I have it, and I don't intend to eat anything but a ketogenic diet anytime in the near future, then if there are a few days when I'm on vacation and it doesn't happen, I'm cool with that. I have no problems with that. I also have no problems being able to balance it out and have a ketogenic meal for breakfast, which we did pretty much every day because you can get bacon and eggs anywhere, and then maybe have some chocolate or wine or something later on that day. And it's just called balance. It's just called life. It's called enjoyment. And it doesn't have to be totally off the rails or totally strict really ever, but specifically when traveling, that's just a question I get a lot about how to be keto while traveling. And you just basically do you. Do everything that you do at home when it's possible. And if there comes a time when it seems like it would be a really good idea for you to enjoy your vacation and eat something you maybe normally wouldn't, go for it. You're going to get right back to it the next meal or the next day or when you get home, it's just not something to really concern yourself with to the point where it ruins your chance at having an awesome time on vacation. So that's that. That's my goal for that story. But let's move on. Just a few quick updates. A reminder that the Fat Burning Female Project November class is quickly approaching. November 1st is the enrollment date and November 3rd will be when you actually get all of your materials delivered for the class. So it's going to be a quick turnaround. We're going to get started. We're going to do it through Thanksgiving, which I'm actually super excited to do with you all and get you ready for the rest of the holiday season in a ketogenic state. I have actually amended the who this project is not right for and I want to go over that and I will go over that in more detail next week on next week's episode before you decide if the project is right for you. So make sure if you are on the fence, if you're not sure if it's right for you, make sure you listen to the first few minutes of next week's episode uh, to get a little more detail of if it's maybe not something that is right for you right now. So we'll talk about that next week. If you are having issues downloading the PDF that was part of last week's episode with all of my supplement recommendations, there was a few hours for some reason right when the podcast aired that that link didn't work and then it kind of fixed itself somehow. So uh, thank goodness because I was on vacation. But um, if you were someone that couldn't download that PDF from the attachment in the show notes, you can try again. I'll even link it in this episode's show notes as well, or you can go back to last week's and try, and it will be working this time. Or you can just type into your browser bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash K-F-W, which stands for Keto for Women, K-F-W SUP, S-U-P-P guide, and that should work for you. That's bit.ly slash KFW SUP guide, S U P P guide. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, head back to episode 18, where I go through all of the supplements that I do and don't recommend for us keto ladies out there. It was a great episode, lots of information, and there's even a supplement guide that is attached to that episode for you to download and get the supplements that I recommend. Okay, moving on to today's episode. I'm absolutely thrilled about this episode. On the Keto for Women show, we generally talk a lot about how the keto diet looks and works and the do's and don'ts. And it's all something that I'm so passionate about, as you can see, because I created an entire podcast around it and a whole business helping women get there. But another huge thing that I'm so passionate about and I have kind of kept somewhat under wraps is this concept of how we talk to ourselves, how we provide ourselves happiness, how we think about our lives in the present moment, the negative words that come into our head and how we can reverse that and think more positively. These are all things that I just learned within the past year and it was something that was absolutely life-changing on so many levels that 
I'm super passionate about it too. And I think I just don't share it very often because honestly, I'm not quite sure how to put it into words yet. (laughs) I don't really know how to describe what needs to happen to actually change your mentality and what that can do for your life. And so I'm still working on that. And trust me, at some point, there will probably be some sort of lesson either on this show or maybe a... Maybe I'll do a webinar or something because it's definitely brewing up within me. I'm just still trying to figure out how to put it into words to a spot where people will get it and hopefully utilize it. Now, however, my guest today, Stephanie Dodier, has formulated that. She has this way of explaining how to change your mentality to change your health and happiness. And that's what we talk about today. It is such an important topic, and I don't want you guys to take this episode lightly. Please take everything we talk about to heart and understand that this is affecting you, even if you don't even realize it. It is affecting you, and it can change your life if you really, truly put this to action. So I'm so excited to have Stephanie here. She is a clinical nutritionist and emotional eating expert, author of the Crave Cure program, inspirational speaker, and host of the Beyond the Food show. Stephanie's integrative and comprehensive approach to nutrition focuses on finding the root causes of your cravings and aligning your body and mind. Stephanie has been there too. Her health journey began six years ago while working as a senior executive in a Fortune 500 corporation. She went from suffering severe panic attacks to transforming her life completely, allowing her to regain her health. Stephanie is passionate about sharing her journey with other women while educating and empowering them to achieve the same results and why she found the Going Beyond the Food Project. The Going Beyond the Food Project is the revolutionary movement that will change the way women relate to food. It's about ditching the diet, transforming the relationship with food, and feeling good. I met Stephanie a few years back on the Low Carb Cruise, and we've since become friends, and I've been on her podcast, and I'm part of her summit that's coming up that we'll chat about, and now it's time for me to have her here so that she can educate us all on how to just change this mindset that's making us all so stuck. And without further ado, let's chat with Stephanie. All right, Steph, thank you so much for coming on Keto for Women's show. I'm super excited for this talk because we've been talking a lot lately, and I know know that we have awesome conversations. (laughs) I know. I'm looking forward to have this conversation in front of your crew, and I'm very happy to meet all of you listeners. Yes, very much so. So in order to do so, why don't you give us your background? Tell us who you are, where you came from, and why you do what you do. Absolutely. So... My story really began with food at the age of 11. So we have to go back way, way back. So I'm, I'm 42 today. So back to the age of 11, my family uh, upgraded. So we bought a bigger house. So we moved from one end of town to the other and ended up in this new neighborhood where I had literally no kids around me. It was only me and my brother. And at that point, I wasn't like my brother was younger. He was a brat. I wasn't friend that much with him. So I ended up alone a lot. And I started cooking as a way of like filling my time and baking cookies and pies and all that stuff because my mom was teaching me how to cook at the same time. So I started to use the cooking process and the food as a way of filling my loneliness. And as you can imagine, I I was using a lot of sugar. I was using a lot of processed food. So I ended up gaining a lot of weight because I ended up eating a lot of that food. And then it started probably around the age of 12 of actually doing it in secret. Like I would bake cookie coming back from school, eat them all with my brother. So my mom would know because my mom was bugging me because I was getting heavy. So fast forward three years, I ended up at Weight Watcher where my mom sent me to lose weight. Um, And clearly that didn't work because like, what is a 14 year old to do among like 40 plus years old women and had no idea and had no control on my food and bad story. So that didn't work. And while this was happening, I was having a lot of negative experience at school because not only was I larger than everyone, I was also taller, 
like literally a foot taller than any other kids around me. I was growing up really fast. So as kids do, I, I got secluded and I got a lot of bullying around me, which made me eat even more. So fast forward to the age of 16, my second diet, and I do it with a group of women, my aunt, and actually, because I was in the setting of a community, became really successful, dropped a whole bunch of weight. And then I became popular at school. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of association with the image of my body, how I was, and how the world liked me. Carry forward 10 years, never had a weight issue between the age of like 17 and 28, never worried about what I was eating. I would eat and never gain weight. Like I was just quote unquote normal person. And at the age of 28, I'm engaged to be married and my fiance lives, leaves me out of nowhere. Like literally breaks up the wedding, takes off and never, never see him again. So as you can imagine at that point, I'm like desperate, heartbroken. Guess what I do? Eat. Turn back to food. Mm -hmm. And as what everything when you overeat and like I literally use food to numb my emotion and I gained a whole bunch of weight, started to overwork, became a workaholic. Fast forward to the age of 36. I'm overweight. I have a lot of anxiety, a lot of other chronic condition. Life is not good. Although outside world, I'm extremely successful in the corporate world, makes a lot of money. My, my job goes well internally. I'm a total disaster. I collapse on stage. Mm. That's when my body could not continue. Like literally my body shut down, like full blown panic attack. Couldn't breathe. My heart was racing, ended up being prescribed anti-depression, anti-anxiety medication, was told that I was pre-diabetic, high cholesterol, like total mess. My body said, like, we ain't doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. And that started my health journey at trying to find solution other than medication. And then fast forward six years later, I quit my job, went back to school. I have my degree in nutrition. I have my podcast and I help other women in that journey of gaining back our health. Oh my gosh, what a story. And really, it, so much about your story is based on emotion. Yes. You but know. here's the thing, and I want you and the listener to understand, this is me now knowing this. Back in the days, I had no clue it was because of emotion. Right. I thought something was wrong with me. It, that's just so crazy. And I think that that is a topic that a lot of women face is that they think something's wrong with them physically and at your level it was your body collapsing and you're yeah. having all of these health issues but that really was all a symptom that was all kind of this culmination of something that had happened previously which was that you were tying your emotions to your food 100%. Yeah, that's so fascinating. I think that's really um, a popular thing in even this low carb keto community. And I know that's why you're here talking and mm -hmm. why you do make such a presence in the keto community is because of that emotional eating. So I definitely want to talk about that. But I want to first get into kind of more of the basic stuff. So what did you do um, how did you get back your health? Because now I'm assuming you're standing there a pretty healthy lady at this point, but you weren't that way. So what did you do to gain your health back? Absolutely. So I asked for help. That's the number one thing. Mm -hmm. So when the doctor prescribed me anti-anxiety and depression, anti-depression medication, I had a choice to make to go on medication and carry on my life or find another solution. So the first thing I did is choose to not take the medication and find something else. I tried all kinds of stuff from hypnotherapy to all kinds of crazy stuff. And I landed in um, the hands of a personal trainer, which was also a health coach. And he was well educated. He was older. I think he was 33 at the time. And he believed in real food paleo lifestyle. Mm. So I was fortunate enough that I ended up with a very qualified personal trainer because it's not always the case, as you know, from being in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, so we did the paleo lifestyle. So literally I went from eating McDonald's because that's what I did. It was Dunkin' Donut in the morning and, and McDonald's at night and didn't eat between that. So we went to eating 
three to four meals a day, real food, started to cook again for myself. So did the basic real food lifestyle, never counted a calorie, never measured anything. And my weight started to fall, like literally melted away. Mm -hmm. And I was exercising a lot. Like I was at the gym three to four times a week. I was doing yoga and all kinds of other stuff. So my weight reduced very quickly and all my other condition in the same way. So no more pre-diabetic, uh, cholesterol stabilized because the inflammation was back to normal, no skin condition. Like all of this went away except one thing, my anxiety. Mm. It got better, but it, it got manageable. So never had a, another panic attack, but I was still present in my, in my life. So from a food perspective, went paleo and little did I know I was actually doing low carb keto because my, my trainer did not want me to focus on food. He just taught me how to do it. But reflecting back, literally what I was doing is low carb keto. And I bet you if I had a measuring stick at that time, I probably was in ketosis because reflecting back, I barely ate no carbohydrate, like not even sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it, it did work out for me and it did resolve most of my, um, health problem except the anxiety. And, and I got to a point about a year and a half later, I'd lost a whole bunch of weight. Life was good, but I was sitting in my office one day at work. I was still working in the corporate world. That's kind of was the beginning of me quitting my job. I looked at everything around me. I'm like, is that what life is all about? Because I'm no more happy in my heart and my head than I was before losing all this weight. From the outside, I look phenomenal and everybody tells me how good I look, but inside I still feel crappy. So that started me in the second path of this journey that said, well, there has to be something else than just my weight. There has to be something else than just how I look to happiness. So there's a book that came in my path at that time from Dr. Carolyn Miss called The Anatomy of the Spirit, which basically explained the whole mind-body science and how what goes on in our head and our thoughts actually influence the biochemistry and how our body responds. And I'm like, oh my God, that's why I'm so unhappy because when I'm alone with myself, the thoughts in my head, oh my God. Like negative, self-destructing, criticizing, judging of myself nonstop. Mm -hmm. So that launched me in that second phase, which when led me to realize I wasn't happy into what I was doing, I needed to nourish other things than just my food. I needed to nourish like what I did in this world, how I served the world, how I interacted with exercise and, and meditation and my thought. And that was the second phase of my getting healthy again. And that's when, after a couple years of that, that's when my anxiety finally settled down. That's crazy and amazing. Yeah. <laughs> because, because I mean, this is when we start speaking the same language, which I know we always do. But you and I in particular, to have both had these experiences where we lose all this weight, everyone's telling us how awesome we look. And we think, because that's what we've been conditioned to think, that um, that's going to bring you happiness. When you get to that ideal weight, or you lose this number um, uh, this amount of pounds, that's when your happiness will come and everything will be roses from there on out. And it doesn't happen. That's not how it works. And for you to then realize, and, and this book sounds amazing, I'm definitely going to read it. And I'll also yeah. link it in the show notes. Um, but for you to have then realized that you what's going on in your head is keeping you from that actual happiness beyond what your body looks like. I think that is so incredibly important to explain to women that it just Absolutely. It, like it's just not that easy you can't just get to this certain goal weight and life is suddenly the most perfect thing you've ever experienced but at the same time I want to say to all the women listening here it's okay and normal that you believe that because that is what we are thought by the health industry by the weight loss industry by the fitness industry mm -hmm. since we're tiny, tiny, tiny. Absolutely. So where you're sitting right now expecting that your weight will bring you happiness is like, 
totally cool because that's what you've learned. And today I'm here telling you all that's not the truth. You're like, what the heck? Like, that's not what I've been told since I'm like four or five years old. Even my mom told me this. So realize that that was a journey for myself as well. It didn't, it wasn't like a plug that I'm like change the disc and I'm going to read a different disc. It took a lot of time and it's still to today. Something that I struggle with is my body image. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Because basically how it all started, you realized that um, you're still unhappy, you lost weight, you're still unhappy. So that's not really what you're actually looking for. You had to change how you talk to yourself. Big time. I had so here. here's the story. Everybody, I'm sure you've talked to them many times about meditation, right? Mm -hmm. So here's my very first. So I read the book and I realize that my thoughts in my head are a mess. And somebody tells me, here's a solution. It's called meditation. So picture this. It's about three and a half year, three, almost four years ago. I'm going into my second bedroom in my house. I'm putting Deepak Chopra 21 day challenge. If anybody's done it, it's free. It's on the internet. Yeah. (laughs) I put day one on, I put this in my ear and I sit and then I reopen my eyes. I'm thinking it's been 15 minutes when in fact it's only been a minute. (laughs) And I'm like, oh my God, this is absolute misery because for that one minute my eyes were closed, all was in my head is you're a loser. You can't figure that out. And that's when I like, oh my God, like my thoughts are toxic. Mm -hmm. So if you've been there, girls, that's okay. We've all been there. So we took a different approach to meditation. And I started to do breathing with movement with yoga, and started to really look at other part of my life and say, what is fueling those negative thoughts? Because yes, processed food is a huge culprit of that sugar is a huge culprit of that. But there's many other things in your life that fuels your negative thoughts. One of them in my case was over exercising. Yes. Big right. Time. So over exercising was fueling my thought because I was doing it strictly from a point of like, I need to look a certain way I have loose skin because I've lost weight. And it's just like, I got to fix myself because something is wrong with me. So I had to detox from that I had to detox from watching the news. Mm, yep. Right? Because there's, there's not an ounce of positivity in the news. And really, it doesn't serve any purposes. Right. So I had to detox. So there's many things I had to remove in my life to allow myself to not put fuel to the fire from outside sources and then get myself by small increment of one minute at a time being able to observe my thoughts without judging them. Because it's a vicious circle. When you start observing your thoughts and you realize how negative they are, here's how it goes. Oh my God, how do I think that? I'm such a loser. What's wrong with me? How do I think that? <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's so true. It never stops, right? It never stops because you're just, you're conditioned to do that and you've been doing that your whole life. And then, so then you always will find the negative instead of always finding the positive, which is what we should be doing. That's exactly what happened. So it's a, it's a journey into doing that and learning to observe your thought without judging them and then get into a place of being comfortable feeling your body. So I, I went into a journey of uh, learning a technique called Vipassana meditation. Um, so I've learned different techniques and start journaling because what I realized is those thoughts were in my head because I never dealt with them. Mm-hmm. Which leads to another aspect of my journey, which call is called like binge eating, because that's what happened when you start being conscious of all of this, and you start removing the control on your food on your exercise, and you're actually be at a place where you l- like, try to experience life for what it is. For me, what happened is, um, I actually started to deal with my emotion in a way of overeating and binge eating. So that came with you trying, like once you became attuned to your thoughts, realized how negative they were, that's kind of when this binging started? Well, it started when I was younger. I stopped when I became happy. Mm -hmm. I stopped using food as a way of numbing. But from the age of 11 forward, there was an association in my brain that you're alone, you're sad, you eat. People like you, you're, you're okay, you look good, you're not miserable, automatically you don't need to eat, right? Mm -hmm. 
So as soon as you go through those phases of unhappiness or like, I hate myself, here comes the food. Right. Does that make sense? Yep. And then you at this point, even though you were getting more in tune with your thoughts, you were still realizing how negative they were. And did that lead you to more binge eating? Yes. 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 Okay. And the deprivation. Yes. And and that's something I, I definitely want to talk about, too, is when you went into this paleo lifestyle, going from a completely different lifestyle, you know, really McDonald's Ooh. and Dunkin' Donuts to paleo, did that spur any of the these um, kind of binge episodes or emotional eating tendencies? Yes and no. The first month, I remember clearly, and Sean, you probably have experienced that as a trainer. I remember doing exercise with my trainer and like whining about the fact I'll never eat chips again. Mm -hmm. And he would say, oh, you know, it's going to pass. It's going to pass. And it did pass. After a couple of months, when the positive influence of the outside world started to come of how good I look, when people started to Mm -hmm. notice I was losing weight, that deprivation went away. Mm -hmm. because it was fueled by all this positivity around me. But at some point, this positivity and everybody reinforcing how good you look goes away because it's just your normal way of being. Then this, these negative feelings start resurfacing. And that's when binging came back for me. And because now it's been two years, two and a half years of eating paleo slash keto low carb and being obsessive compulsive about it, Because God forbid, if I could like ever gain any weight again would be the end of the world, I would control, control, control. And when I realized that if I wanted to be happy, I needed to let go of some of that control and actually live my life. That's when binging came back. Mm, I see. That's like keto is great. Keto is great. But don't forget you're eliminating a whole bunch of stuff. Right. And if you go into it, which is why what I talk about here so much, if you go into it thinking it's going to be your next diet or crash course or whatever it's going to be, then this is all going to still be there. You're still going to want to have these binges. You're still going to go totally off the rails. You're going to have these cheat days and all this stuff. Um, when you don't think of it as a lifestyle and you and you go into it as a diet. And that's what you kind of have to shift. And if that means that sometimes you're having some carbs, then go ahead and have some carbs. Voila. But you see, my <laughs> attitude was like 100% all the time. My perfectionism mm-hmm. drove me to want to be in 100%. And I bet you at the time, like keto strip likely existed, but nobody ever talked about it because two and a half years ago, keto was like under, under, underground, right? Right, right. And I bet you if there was keto strip and all the stuff, I would have been all over this, like compulsively, obsessively doing it. It's just it didn't exist or I wasn't aware of it, so I never did it. But what happened is that after two and a half years of everywhere where you go carrying your food mm-hmm. and saying no, 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 no to everything in your life, you start building resentment. So what do you do? What do you do then? How did you get out of that? How did you make it more of something that you could just do for life? balance. Mm -hmm. So for me, my number one rule, if you want to say rule when it comes to food, is just eat real food. Mm -hmm. So it's not a rule as much as a respect for myself. So I started to look at food not as a way of controlling my weight and getting to an outcome of a weight or health issue, but as a mean of respect for myself. So real food is a mean of respect for myself. It's non-negotiable. And that being all said, I no longer carry my food everywhere that I go. So if I end up, I don't know, at a place where there's only processed food, I'm not going to let myself starve to not make the best choice possible in front of me. Mm -hmm. Right? It's always about the best choice possible of what's in front of you. So that, that is number one. So understanding real food, then listening to my body. Because my body will tell me what it likes and what it doesn't like. So for me, my body, because of 20 years, well, more than that, 30 years of abusing of it, my body has a hard time keeping up the high carbohydrate diet, even though it could be just like real clean stuff. 
it doesn't sustain that for a long period of time. I'm not in the best mental state. I'm not in the best physical state. I'm not in the best emotional state. So automatically my choice are geared towards lower carbohydrate, higher fat option, not because that's what I have to do because that's the diet I'm on, more because my body operates better at that place. Does that make sense? Yes, that's such a good way to put it. Such a good way to determine that is how do you feel best? It doesn't have to be on any, you you can call it whatever you want. It's your, yes. your way of eating and it doesn't have to be keto. It doesn't have to be paleo, whatever, but things that are going to nourish you and make you happy and you enjoy eating, but also make you feel the absolute best. And that's the thing. You don't know what's going to make you feel best until you felt better. Mm -hmm. So I could have never, I could have not known what I know today unless I would have gone in and clean up my diet and, and done three, four, five, six months of this paleo lifestyle and learn from my coach everything that I needed to learn and then to realize, oh my God, that's the way we can live our life and feel like I want more. Yes. Please give me more of this. Um, yeah. So I want to talk about how you were able to, because you, like everyone else, all the other women out there, grew up with this need to diet. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're in the same boat for sure. So how did you change that mentality? Because it, it doesn't even seem like it's been all that long ago that you've been able no. to change your mentality from I need to eat this way so that I don't gain weight or I continue to lose weight or whatever to I'm just going to not worry about it and I'm just going to nourish myself. That's called to me self growth. So it it's a bunch of stuff. It's not a perfect formula. But if I can say one big principle is that it's about looking inside for the answer instead of outside. So when we are looking at a diet mindset, the foundation of that is a body ideal. The only reason why we do a diet is because we want to lose weight and achieve a physical ideal that the world is reflecting that we need to be. Mm -hmm. So that would be the first item that I needed to detach from. The fact that my A, my happiness wasn't going to come from this image. And that two, the only reason why I wanted to achieve this image is because of what the environment around me was wanting me to be. And understanding that this isn't like modern society image. It's not the case in still many country today and many culture today. And it certainly hasn't been the case before modern society. This is only the result of the marketing industry, food, weight loss industry, wanting us to create that need so they can create a product behind it. Mm -hmm. So understanding this whole thing, this whole thing that I've summed up to you in like 30 seconds, <laughs> and accepting it. So when I work with people, it's always knowledge, and then go home and accept it. Because I can teach you a whole bunch of stuff about mindset and about the way to change your thought. But if you really don't believe in them, it's not going to change the way you are, it's not going to change your mindset. So you got to sit with this and really accept this what I just told you about body image and make it part of your life, which means, and it meant for me, being able to stand in front of a mirror naked. For many, many, many women, I don't know, Sean, if you've ever done that, you did that in competition, right? Standing mm -hmm. in a bathing yeah. suit. But for many women, I'm, I'm going to challenge all of you who can do that and not start judging yourself. That's where it gets tricky. Not finding all the stuff you wish would be different. Voila. That's the hard part for many people. So it's accepting the moment, pr the present moment. And that's the whole philosophy behind meditation, right? Is accepting the moment present, the thoughts in your head that are present, but also the body that you have today. And realize that what you're seeking, which all of us are seeking, we may not know it, but we're all seeking happiness and health. Yep. That's how the human body is wired. So you're seeking happiness and when you're reflecting this image in the mirror, you're criticizing your body because you're believing your body is preventing you from achieving happiness. So accepting who you are for what you are today, there's nothing wrong with wanting to lose weight. 
I'm all for that. Like I'm not like I'm not promoter of a weight loss program. I'm saying there's nothing wrong of wanting you to lose weight. But the first thing you need to do is accept what you are today, how you are today, and accepting that your happiness won't come from that you losing weight. It will come from you doing everything else in your life. From a lifestyle and a mindset perspective, that's where happiness is going to come from. You still can want to lose weight. Nothing wrong with that. Totally agree. I think that's really important is that it's not like a bad thing for you to want to lose weight. It's just the how we've been taught to do that is incredibly unhealthy and not promoting happiness. <laughs> so no. if we keep those things in mind, which is that we are wired to want to be happy and healthy, that also means that um, acceptance needs to be a huge piece of your life and coming to your body and the weight that you may want to lose from that place of acceptance and love and peace and knowing that it has so much more to do with um, what's going on in your head and in the rest of your body health wise beyond just like I eat this thing and I lose weight or I don't eat this thing and I lose weight. Like you just we have to get away from that mentality. And unfortunately, we still live in a society that is just not even close to being there. No. And recognize also the other big piece of that is control. And that is a symptom of a lot of us that have been or want to be on the ketogenic diet. We have this control issue in our life and we express that through our food choices and our belief around food. That was another big piece of acceptance for me that this expression of control that I had in my life and in the way that I work and in the way that I run my relationship around my own life, don't have kids, but my friends and my relationship around me, I express control because I don't trust that I am good enough in the moment present. Mm -hmm. So I want to control everything around me so I can be sure of the outcome because being just the way that I am today is not good enough. So I got to go and control everything around me. And food was an expression of that over the last four or five years. I took this control aspect of my life and express it through my food by being overly compulsive around my food choices. And that drove a lot of binging. Because mm -hmm. the more control you apply to your diet the more expression of that need for control you do towards your food, the more rebellion your mind has in regards to food. What do you say to the people that when hearing that they think, well, if I don't control my food, I'm just going to have one big giant binge and I'm never going to stop binging and I'm just going to eat McDonald's every day. That's a very possible thing that you will do that as an act of rebellion. Right. right. So once you've held control long enough, you may rebel. But here's the thing. You now know how good feel. You will not stay on that binge forever. Because at some point, the food will no longer have this attraction because you will feel shitty. Excuse my language. No, go ahead. Right. It's and true. I've been through this. Right. I went like I had many binge episodes and I gained some weight of like that place of. Oh, my God, I'll never have bread again. Watch me, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to have bread for two weeks in a row. But you know what? After like a week of having heartburn, like, you know what? Like, th this is not good. I don't feel good. I have heartburn. I go to bed and my esophagus burns. Like, no, you know what? Bread, no. Like, it's not going to work for me right now because I know that I can feel better. For me, that's what I would say to people, like, you know that you can feel better and there's so much going back to that whole food you will do before you actually wake up and say, that's not the way that I want to feel because I have so much to live in my life. Going into the emotional eating aspect of this, because I think yeah. a lot of this is this is one of them. Um, binge eating is an emotional component with food. Like we have this emotional relationship with food. Why, why do we do that? Why does that happen? Why do we get into becoming emotional eaters in the first place? I would say to you, we all have compensatory addiction or choices that we make in our life. We in this podcast have 
food as a food as a choice of uh, as a way of compensating for our emotion but there is many other one alcohol drugs sex shopping workaholism like these are all ways into which we use an outside element as a mean of numbing our emotion the only difference between drugs alcohol and food food is legal mhm so i can use food to make me feel better because a it is an actual biochemistry reaction in your brain when you eat you release dopamine when you binge for short term you release dopamine into your brain you feel better and we all know the effect of sugar being on the podcast that we are today how it makes us feel short term but it makes us feel better the same goes with alcohol and drugs and and sex and all of those other quote unquote addiction it makes us feel better so it combats this negative emotion that we have anger jealousy whatever the emotion that doesn't feel good in our body and then we bring this element from the outside environment we put it into our body and for a short term boom 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 all the wires in our brain wakes up and makes us feel better that's where emotional eating comes from because it really makes us feel better and for many reason some people will say genetic the culture you are in the relationship to food your parent had you will choose food over other outside elements if you're from a family of highly sport oriented people you probably will choose running or triathlon or ironman like these people are likely using sport as a way of numbing their own emotion mhm right yep so i would say there's multiple factor why we choose food for me in my case it was family like my entire family uses food as a way of numbing um so therefore i inherited the gene quote on quote by i inherited the environment into which promoted that i still remember i don't know i was probably 8 or 9 years old my dad coming back from work and he had had a promotion at work and he came back home with t-bone steak back in the 80s i was a big thing <laughs> <laughs> And I remember him looking at us and saying, "This is what money can buy and this is what you get when you do well." Ah. Right? Mhm. Mm I discovered that through years of therapy <laughs> back in the <laughs> days, right? So I was very young, there was an association, well, you do well, you get to eat good food. Mhm. Mm so that's how for me it went, but there's many reasons, hopefully people can find their own. Yeah, definitely. And so then when you find your own, when you find that reason that's drawing you to have these emotional eating tendencies and it doesn't have to be binging, it could even be um a restricting tendency or, you know, having these quote unquote cheat days or whatever. There it could doesn't necessarily have to be binging. But once you find that um and you're able to to figure out the connection that you're making, is there a way out? Absolutely. So, a number one is awareness, right? Knowledge, awareness, acceptance of that, and then rewiring your brain to other ways of making yourself feel good. So, when you feel this emotion and you end up in front of the fridge looking for something to eat, you have now this awareness like, "Oh, what am I doing here?" I no longer am a victim of my emotion. I am now empowered to make a different choices so it is about recreating groove in your brain that when you feel quote unquote bad about something or you have a negative emotion you're going to go to something else so if you um if you go on my website or you get my crave cure guide which is that freebie thing that i have on my website one of the thing that i teach is called the crave cure formula and what it is it's a simple 10 minutes exercise when you are in a state of emotional eating where you sit for about 10 minutes breathing in and out by the nose with your mind observing how your body is and how your body feels and then changing that state of negative emotion in your body simply by breathing in and out and observing your body and it works like magic eight times out of 10 you can literally dismantle and remove this state of not feeling good and not 
being good because of a negative emotion and it just disappear. And you leave that 10 minutes period, not denying the craving, not depriving yourself, but not desiring it anymore. Because what's driving it is the emotion and you've managed it to breathing and observation of your body. The power of breathing. Oh Isn't my that God. that crazy? <laughs> it it's really could be that simple, but it's so true and none of us do it. But this is very important. Um, okay, so you have a podcast, Going Beyond the Food, and yes. you, you also have a summit coming up, Going Beyond the Food, which I am in. It's super, yes. we had a great conversation. I just loved that conversation. I can't wait for people to hear it. But tell me why this is the title of everything that you do. What does that mean to you? Going beyond the food is my personal journey is starting from a place of food being really important for my health and realizing that there's so much more than just food, that 80% of the solution to me wanting to be happy, which again is the underlying desire of all of us being here today is being happy, had to do with more than just food. Food is a starting point to launch you and give you give you the capacity to look at everything else in your life without being judging of it by reeducating yourself with exercise and how your body function and we, during your interview we did talk about like hormonal and adrenal health and we talked about mindset and whole belief with other people that spoke on the summit so it's exploring everything else beyond the food because let's be honest there is a gazillion of summit and podcasts about food. There are. Right? And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so what However, we, we, we do need to know that information. However, there's so much more to it. And nobody talks about this stuff. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the biggest one that's lacking? For me is loving ourselves without judgment. Because from that place, when you can accept yourself for who you are today without judgment, it's the launching pad for you to make different choices. Mm -hmm. And not making those choices from a place of lack, a place of not being good enough and wanting to beat yourself up with X, Y, Z you want to choose to do. But instead, making choices that will be nourishing to you beyond food. Right? We're talking about the right choices of exercise for yourself, the right way of meditating for yourself, you taking a bath at night instead of grabbing a glass of wine when the kids go to bed. Right? But for that, you need to love yourself. You need to accept yourself. To be seeing those choices as not a deprivation, a must do because I want to achieve weight, but rather because I want to take care of myself. So to me, that is the biggest one is that place of acceptance and self-love. And what do you think is the, your number one tip for even getting started on a self-love journey? Because I know there's a lot of women missing that link in the keto community in particular, because like you said, they're so focused on the control and the food and the, and the diet that we forget that we are actual humans that have emotions and needs and goals and other ways of life. So what do you think is the best way to get started on that journey? Breath and ah, observation of your body. That. And it costs nothing. And here's the thing why there's not many summit or podcasts about this whole going beyond the food is because like a lot of this thing is free. Mm -hmm. Like there's not a lot of money to be made from this. So this whole 10 minutes exercise of your breath and getting to be in your body and feel your body is the number one thing you can do to accept of your own self of how you are today. And literally lay on your bed, close your eyes, breathe in and out by the nose, not by the mouth. There is a very scientific reason why we do that by the nose. We'll skip that today. Just trust me in and out by the nose, and then start from the top of your head and literally put your mind in your body, like from the head to your eyes to behind your nose and scan your entire body. It's going to be difficult. Your mind is going to think about the grocery list. Your mind is going to think about where you need to be and what you should be doing. And then all you have to do for 10 minutes is bring back your mind to wherever it wants to go to being in your shoulder. It's going to run away again, bring it back being in your chest. 
and do that constantly and you will start building that connection with your own body. Mm-hmm. And from there you have no choice but to start to be conscious of yourself, aware and loving towards yourself. And I'll put the link to, in order to get that Crave Cure guide uh, from your website. That's a free guide. So I'll put that link in the show notes as well. One other thing that I think is, you know, we talked about it earlier in this episode is just even getting to the point where you can acknowledge the types of thoughts you're having in your mind mm. on a day-to-day basis, on a constant basis, because mm-hmm. more, more than likely they're negative. Oh, yeah. And and I'm not going to get into this as to why that is. But if you want to know, go to my podcast, dig out episode 67 with Dr. Bruce Lipton. Do you know who Bruce Lipton is, Sean? I don't know. So Bruce Lipton is a is a doctorate, PhD in biochemistry, and he studied the brain. Mm. And so he's um, an expert as as being able to explain that we have two parts to our brain. There is a conscious mind and there is the subconscious mind. So picture an iceberg coming off the of the ocean. You have that small little tip at the top. That's the conscious mind. And then the subconscious mind is everything below the water that you're not aware of. That's the same place that makes your heart beat, that makes you breathe without thinking about it. It's literally subconscious. You're not aware of it. And that is where something called the ego is. Mm-hmm. The ego is what drives your negative thoughts. So if you don't have a mind fitness activity, AKA meditation, breathing, being in your body, your subconscious mind runs the show. Negative and, thoughts. And you, yeah, you have to connect with that. Mm. You have to even know that that's a thing, right? And most of us just assume that we only have this one place that we can be in our mind, but you can r- recognize your ego and turn it off, basically, like shut it down. Or put it in the place where it needs to be, which is survival. Yes. And let's face it, 90% of us have no life-threatening situation in our life right now. So this ego needs to be tuned down because we don't need it to help us survive. So there's there's a whole science behind that. And it's, yeah, woo-woo stuff, but it's a fact. Like, it's scientifically demonstrated. So go back and listen to this entire, it's one hour and 15 minutes, and he does a brilliant job explaining conscious subconscious mind and how those negative thoughts happen in our head constantly. Oh, I love so, that. So education, that's the number one step, right? So great. Yes. And we will, I'll link to that too. So people can get to that easily, but really they should just listen to all your podcast episodes because they're amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I want to tell more people about this summit. So let everyone know how going beyond the food summit is going to work because it's coming up soon. Yes, yeah, so you can register for it. It's, it's a free event. Starts registration on October the 20th until November 1st. And November 1st, for those who have registered giving me their name and their email, I'm going to be sending you a daily email from November 1st to the 7th with four to five speakers, talk or slash interview on 21 different subjects that have nothing to do with food, but have to do with your ability to manage your weight. So totally free. You're going to get this link every day. You can watch all the talk. And then um, we will have also the ability for you to purchase to own all of this, the PDF, the audio and all of that. But that is a paid version that you don't have to get. You can totally watch everything for free. What I want the listener to do is I want us, yes, come and, and register, but I want you, yes, you, help me get the word around because this is going against the fitness, the weight loss, and the health industry. This is all the stuff that they don't want us to know, because when we know that, we don't buy the gizmo. Right. So you need to help me help Sean get the word out to the world. So share it with your friends, with your girlfriends, on your Facebook, however you share it. So everybody has access to this free information, November 1st to the 8th. And let's all start a revolution. Let's be empowered with information so we can achieve our goal without having to feel miserable about it. 
And really, that's kind of both you and I, that's our entire goal. Like that is both of our life purpose is Mm -hmm. to get out this information to kind of go against what a lot of us have been fed all these years growing up and to get onto a different kind of path where you are working on your happiness and your health and you're not doing detrimental things to your body in the process. So I mean, we, I have a really good community here. I say this all the time on these podcast episodes to share this information because we have to start getting the word out. We have to start spreading the message that we can go against what we've been hearing for so long and do things the right way for our bodies and our minds and our health. So we'll get the word out there. Don't worry. They're really good at that. <laughs> <laughs> it's called a grassroots movement. Yes. Absolutely. And that's what we need to do. That's what we all need to do because we can't rely on the mass media to get this information. Just an FYI, I had to work loop around to be even able to advertise the going to be on the food project on Facebook. Wow. Really? Because Facebook does not allow any type of like diet stuff on Facebook. So I had to like work my text around and my image around to be able to advertise it on Facebook. This is how crazy this stuff is. Oh my gosh. That is so nuts. It's okay. Don't worry. We have podcasts that we have friends that tell friends that tell friends. And that's really important. It's really, if you believe it, that means that you have to get your loved ones involved because you have to help them with their health and happiness as well. So um, we will get that going for sure. And I will, of course, link to the uh, sign up page for the free summit on this podcast show notes. So make sure you're going to that. Click the link and we'll get you enrolled so you can get all that free info. Awesome. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to have you here. Such a good conversation as always. But it really like we have just just, like such different stories, but yet they're so parallel that I mean, I could just talk to you all day long about it. Yeah, and we're likely going to do that. And have you told your crew where you're going in three weeks? Yes, they know. Yes, they know I'm going to Mallorca (laughs) for the low carb universe. And guess who's going to be there? Me. Yay! <laughs> yeah, so we'll be doing a lot of that. We'll be hanging out probably yeah. for like two weeks straight. So <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> I'm so looking forward to it. I can't wait to see you there in person. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah because we-, we create a different connection in person. Totally. Absolutely. But thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and just being so open about it. I think it's really important for that message to get out to the world. So thank you. And we look forward to the summit. And uh, thank you for having me. Hey lady, do you want to make sure that you are doing the ketogenic diet the right way for you? Do you want to make sure you're getting all of those amazing benefits that come with producing ketones and not putting any extra stress on your body? Then head to my website and check out the Fat Burning Female Project. We have a new class starting soon and I'd love to have you be a part of it. Head to bit.ly slash fatburningfemale That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash fat burning female. And make sure to sign up to get a notification of when the next class will be. Can't wait to see you there.